Good morning, and welcome to uh, this Sunday's message. Uh, this is the final part in our five-part series on uh, asking questions about things in the life of Jesus, the fact that he would come down to us uh, and be human amongst us, the fact that he would teach and perform miracles to us, uh, the fact that he would go to the cross, that he would raise from the dead. Do any of these things matter? Uh, and does it matter that we hold to these principles as biblical doctrine? And today we're going to look at the return of Jesus Christ. Now, the return of Jesus Christ is different for a lot of people. You see, there, there are so many details to it, but at the same time, the Bible doesn't give us all of these details. And so some people like to jump headlong into these kinds of things and just dig and dig and dig and, and will oftentimes even read things that aren't necessarily there just in an effort to try to find what is going on, what will be the process of this. And some people, on the other hand, look at all of that and they say, it's all such a mess and how can any of it actually be known? I'm just going to leave it alone altogether. Today we're going to talk about this and, and we're not going to get into all of the, the details of it. Today what we're going to look at is just does it matter? Does the doctrine of the return of Christ matter at all? Is it something we can push to the side and say, some people like it, some people like to read about it, but for me, it makes no difference, uh, whether it be here or there or whenever it may come. And we're going to answer that question with, yes, it absolutely matters. Now, that, th that is going to be a bit unsatisfactory for some some people are going to want to say, well, you know, Tim, I, I think we should learn about some of these details and we should look into these things. And, and I agree. I agree. I, I think what happens next is an important thing for us to study. So this is what we're going to do. We are going to put together a Bible study and we are going to start a, a Bible study on Zoom. Uh, not this not tonight, but next Sunday night, we are going to begin. It will get to you the details of how to sign up and how it is, uh, what time it is we're going to meet. All of those details will be coming to you later. You'll have an opportunity to sign up for that. Uh, it's not going to be the kind of thing where you're going to have to sign on and you're going to have to talk and feel awkward and all that kind of stuff. The, the way it's going to work is this, that I, I'll be doing the majority of the teaching uh, and then you'll have opportunity in a chat to ask questions along the way, and we can answer those questions. And we're going to do this weekly. We'll begin with talking about death and what death means, the departure of this life, uh, and, and what it looks like between now and the coming of Christ. And then we will talk about different biblical ideas on the coming of Christ. We'll weigh those different schools of thought against each other. It should be a great time, uh, and it will establish for us a hope. And so in some ways, this sermon is a culmination of all of these major elements of Christ and whether or not they truly matter to us, and it is an introduction to a study of eschatology, next things, the, the life after this life uh, and the coming of Christ. And so let's just go ahead and get started. The first thing that I want to point out to us is that this matters because this is the promise of God. If you would look with me in John chapter 14, and at this point in John, what Jesus is doing is he's preparing his disciples for his departure, for his journey to the cross. And in John chapter 14, he says this, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me, because in my Father's house there are many rooms. If it were not so, what I have told you, that I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again, I will come again, and will take you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. Now, I, I want to be careful not to get ahead of myself because, to be honest with you, all three of my points appear in all three of the passages that we're going to look at. So particularly what we want to look at in this passage is the idea that Jesus promises his disciples that he will be coming back for them, that the only reason he left was to prepare a place for them. He goes on to say uh, later on that while he's gone, he will not leave them as orphans in verse 18, but he will give them the Holy Spirit, which is what he's going to get to. But he says, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come 
to you. So we are not abandoned by Christ after his resurrection and his ascension, but instead we are set up in such a way that he says, I have gone on a temporary journey and I am coming back for you. While I am gone, you are going to receive the Holy Spirit. But you're not orphans. You're not fatherless. You're not without me. I'm just going to prepare a place for you and I will be back. It matters that we believe in the return of Christ. It matters that we talk about it. It matters that we live with it in mind because it is a promise of God. And if Jesus does not return, then Jesus has lied to us. Jesus tells us that he is coming back. He establishes that expectation that we are to live by. And so we live in that expectation. Christ has told us he will return. He most certainly will return. The next thing I want to point to is I want to point to the fact that this return of Christ is our expectation in Christian life. We live in such a way as to expect the return of Christ. There there are so many ideas out there about what it means to be a Christian and how we live the Christian life and things that we do and things that we don't do. And and all of those things are good. And we we may even argue that these things come from an expectation and, and living out the idea that Christ has died for me. And so the cross and, and the atonement and the grace and the mercy that we have received, we love because we were first loved. That is very true. But another reason we live the Christian life the way we live the Christian life is because Jesus will be returning. He will come back. Look with me in Matthew chapter 25. Now, all of Matthew 24 and 25, all of these passages are talking about the return of Jesus Christ. There are so many sections here that are are commonly understood. And, And what I would encourage you to do is I would encourage you to read 24 and 25 all the way through together so that you get a big picture of what Jesus is trying to teach his disciples about his own return. But what we're going to do is we're going to take one passage out of that, out of the middle of of these things. Uh, in, In 25, he has just finished talking in a parable about 10 virgins who are waiting in anticipation for the coming of the groom. And then in verse 14, he gives us the parable of the talents. And I know that there's a good chance you've probably heard this, but let's go ahead and read it together. For it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. He who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them, and he made five talents more. So also he who had the two talents made two talents more. But he who had received the one talent went away dug in the ground, and hid his master's money. Now, many of you have heard this, and I'm sure you've heard lots of sermons on this, but I want to take a moment and just establish what is going on. The master has left his servants, and in leaving his servants, he has equipped his servants according to their ability. So he has assessed them, and he has equipped them And when he leaves, his servants take opportunity to apply what they have been given. Now, sometimes uh, I I find it almost unfortunate. A a talent is is a currency. It's not necessarily an ability. And so we look at talents, and, and a lot of times... We have to admit, right, this story has come down to us like, oh, well, you know what? I'm not a terrible singer, so I should join the choir. After all, it's the talent that God has given me, and I need to apply that talent uh, in such a way as to serve him. And I better not bury my talent uh, because that would be less than optimal. Now, you know what? It, that may be the case. Maybe God has equipped you in such a way that you have an ability to use your gift in such a way as to bring honor to him. And if you feel convicted in that way, 100%, by all means, you need to apply that gift. That is the teaching. But I want us to understand that this teaching 
is in the context of the discussion of the return of Christ. And I think when we see it in that light, we understand that there is something far more powerful, far more imminent that is taking place here. You see, the master being Jesus, we being the servants, he has gifted us and he has departed. So he has given us the Holy Spirit. He has given us the gifts of the Spirit. He has assigned us each according to our abilities and he has gone away. Some apply these things well. Some sit for fear that they might mess things up or, or that it wouldn't be just perfect. And then it says this. Now, after a long time, verse 19. Now, after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. So the master has gone, and Jesus is declaring himself that master. He has gone, and he has returned. So again, just like we had in John chapter 14, the promise that he would return, he goes, and then he returns to them to settle accounts with them. And he who had received the five talents, came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here I have made five talents more. And his master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over little, and I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he also, who had the two talents, came forward saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here I have made two talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. I want to take a moment. I want to pause here looking at these two faithful servants. Sorry for the spoiler, the third will be unfaithful, but I want to show you what has taken place in here. You know, a lot of times people look at their opportunity to give to the church and they, they look to the pastor and they say, well, I can't teach. I don't have seminary degrees and, and I, I don't speak well in front of people. I can't teach, so I am of no use to the church. And so I sit on the sidelines and I do little not realizing that not everyone is given a position that is an upfront, visible work. Maybe you're great at organizing a kitchen and keeping it clean. We need a kitchen organizer at our church right now. Ours has served us for years, and we need someone to step into her role as she has taken the opportunity to step out of that for now. You know, one time, one time I had this great opportunity where a man came to me, he was, he was walking, he was at sort of this crisis of faith in his life, and he was walking past the church there in Toronto where I was pastoring at the time, and, and just walking through, he stopped and just felt the urge to come into the church and talk, and, and we had the opportunity to talk about what the gospel is and what it means to our lives, that it's, it's not about us doing better, but it's about what Christ has done for us on the cross, and, and, and the man became a Christian, and he was baptized, and in our conversation, he made a very interesting statement to me. He said, Tim, I want to give back. I want to be a part of the church. I'm so excited for this but I'm just not ready to teach yet. I don't know anything. I'm going to have to just kind of ride along. And, and I said, well, what do, you, what do you do for a living? That's not always the test of what you have best to offer the church, but sometimes it's a good starting point. And the man said to me, he said, well, I don't know how it really affects the church, but I design theme parks. And I was dumbfounded. Who has a more fun job than to travel around the world designing theme parks and zoos and water parks and these kinds of things. It was a fantastic job. And he's like, yeah, that's the, the business that I own and that's the work that we do, uh, but I don't know how that applies to the church. And I said, let's go downstairs. And we went downstairs and I showed him the kid's wing and I said, look at this. This needs your help. It needs your touch. The gift that you have is very much applicable here in our church in an immediate way. 
What do you do? What can you do to bless your church? What can you do to further the work of God? Can you pray? Can you call people and check in on them, especially in this season that we're in where, where people are struggling with loneliness, just organizing phone calls and saying, hey, let's get together and let's just talk. And let's get to know each other. I mean, it's great to get together with your friends because that feeds your own need for social uh, gathering. But at the same time, why not call people from the church that maybe you don't normally talk to? Maybe they're not immediate circle kind of friends and use this as an opportunity to grow that relationship. What are ways that you can apply the things that God has given you toward his work, the furtherment of his worship, the encouragement of his body, and the evangelization of the lost in his name? He also, who had received the one talent, came forward saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man. Reaping where you do not sow and gathering where you do not scatter seeds. So I was afraid and I went and I hid your talent in the ground. Here, have what is yours. Now this, this person looked and they said, I understand what everyone else did. I, I see that, but I, I also see this. I also see that I didn't want to mess things up. You know, I, I had something but I didn't want to do it the wrong way. I didn't want to go about it in a bad way. So I made the decision that nothing is better than something. And sometimes we do this. Sometimes we make the decision of, you know, well, I don't have great things to give, but my nothing is better than my something because I don't want to be a burden to the work of Christ. I don't want to be a, a burden to the church. I don't want to make a mistake or to make a fool of myself. And so we choose this option. And our assumption is this. Our assumption is that we would go to God and we would say, well, you created me. You knew my hesitations. You knew my struggles. And so surely you understand what it is that I decided to do and why I decided to do it. I was afraid. I didn't lose what you gave me, but I didn't turn it into something more. I didn't invest it. I didn't apply what you gave me. And his master answered him in verse 26, you wicked and slothful servant, you knew that I reap where I do not have not sown and gathered where I have not scattered seed. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers. And at my coming, I should have received what was my own with interest. I, I think the analogy here, the best way for us to understand this analogy in the Christian life is to understand this. This servant, uh, if we are talking about the salvation uh, work of God and that, that he has called us to bring glory to his name and to spread his word, this servant is coming before Jesus at the throne of judgment, and they are saying, I am here. You saved me, and, and I, I looked after myself. Maybe not. Maybe you saved me is going too far, as we'll see in the future here. Uh, but I was looking after my salvation. I was reading the Bible. I was going to church. I was taking care of me, and I, I never got around to really being concerned about other people. I never got around to being concerned about the church or the world, but I, I looked after me. I wanted to be a follower of you, and Jesus says, that's, that's, not, that's not it. This is not about you. This is about you being a faithful to me and investing in me. In verse 28, he says, So take the talent from him and give it to him who has the ten talents. For everyone who has will more be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away and cast the worthless servant into outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. 
Now, I want to be perfectly honest with you in this. I, I want to be perfectly honest with you to say that, that he would call him a servant and that this servant would find themselves in what is obviously a place of hell is a bit confusing to me. And, and I, I don't know exactly how this works. This, this is by no means saying that if you are not uh, faithfully working then you will lose your salvation. I, I think the rest of the Bible tells us that that's not how we're supposed to read this. I think what it is is telling us instead is that this servant was only pretending to be faithful and devoted to his master. He was looking out for himself, and he was not looking out for his master's plan. I think that is the best way to read this. And I also want to be certain that when we read this, we don't look and be like, you know, a, a guy that reaps where he hadn't sown and, and all that kind of stuff, I, that doesn't sound like a great picture of Jesus. I, I think that is to, to say that, that there are, uh, when Jesus says, I have other sheep that are not of this fold, that, that the Jews, the Gentiles outside of the Jewish nation are people that he is gathering, that he is about the work of gathering all who would come and that work being scattered across the world and in many different contexts, that is what he is saying about his work here. And this servant says, I knew that, I understood it, and I looked after me. In the end, he was not about his master's work. He was about himself. He was not about the proclamation of that which his master was for. He was about taking care of number one. And so I think inside of this discussion of the coming of Christ, we understand this story better, that this is about our entire life's work, that we live and we work in an expectation to know that He is coming at any point. This is particularly pointed out for pastors and elders in 1 Peter. In 1 Peter, he says, and when the good shepherd returns... That we are to, as pastors and elders, be caring for the flock, spiritually leading them and nurturing them and loving them in Christ, teaching them, raising them up, guarding them, all of the things that a shepherd would do for a flock in expectation that the good shepherd is returning. And here the church lives out that exact same thing as a whole. The whole of the church understands that because the master is returning, I need to be about the master's work and not about my own work, not about myself. And lastly, I want to point to you that this is important. The return of Christ is important because it is the start, the initiation of our hope realized. 1 Peter chapter 1 says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to His great mercy. He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead in an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. So this, this hope, this inheritance that we are waiting for is not ours in the moment, not fully. It is being kept in heaven for us, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation, for a salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. Even our salvation is not in full. It's not fully realized. We are justified now in that we live under Jesus who would say, those who are in me, I have claimed and I have covered with my righteousness. But we will realize that. We will actually cash that check. It is it's as if we have been given a check. You receive a check, if you remember what it's like to receive a check. You don't yet have money. You have promise for money, and you cash that check, and at that point, that money is realized. You receive it. Justification is our salvation promised, and that is realized in the last time, either the end of this life or when Christ returns. And in this we rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to, pray, to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation or the return of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him, though you do not see him you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. And then he picks this back up in verse 13. Therefore, 
prepare your minds for action. And being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And so, see, in, in 1 Peter, again, we have the, the totality of all that we are expected to do, all the reasons why this matters. We have the idea that it is the promise. Peter here promises this Jesus is returning. He tells us how to set our lives. We prepare our minds for action. Being sober-minded, we set our hope fully on this thing that is to come. And when it comes, it will be the realization of our salvation. Our hope is not in this life. Do you remember last week when we were reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and Paul said, if our hope in Jesus is for this life only, we are most of all to be pitied? And this is not the time to live our best life. And this is not the time to reap all of our reward in Christ. Now, there is an already but not yet way that we live in Christ and that we already have much joy and peace and we are carried by him and he works in our hearts, but we have not yet received that in full. We live in anticipation of the more to come. And I would encourage you to live your Christian life in anticipation for more to come. I said at the beginning of this that we are going to be having a Bible study, and, and I hope that some of you heard that and you thought, oh, interesting topic. I'll join because I'm interested in the topic. I want to speak to another group of you. I want to speak to the group of you who may not be interested in the topic. And I want to tell you, you need to be interested in the topic. You need to join this Bible study if you're not interested, because you need to understand why it is so important that you would be interested. Peter tells us that we live in expectation of that day. And if we're not interested in that day, then we have no anticipation of it, no expectation of it. If we live our Christian life for this life only, we are doing well, but it is insufficient because we are living for a temporal thing instead of living for an eternal thing. And God has called us to live in light of His return, the keeping of His promise, the expectation with which we live in as Christians, and our hope realized, that initiation of our hope realized, are the things to come. And so, yes, they matter. I want to take a moment and I want to pray with you. Father God, I thank you for the opportunity that we have to come into your word. God, I thank you that you came first as the child, raised up to be our teacher, our sacrifice, to stamp your seal of authority in your resurrection. God, I thank you for your promise that you are coming again. And God, with saints of old, who would cry, Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. God, I pray that the call of our church would no longer be so strongly temporal, but God, that we would live with this holy expectation of our hope realized and we would long for the day that you would return. God, I heard just this morning someone say that the only two people who really understand this are people who live in physical, financial pain, social pain in this life who just want it gone. And those people who are so in touch with the weight of sin that they just want the burden of sin lifted, that these people who struggle in this way are living in anticipation of your return. But God, that there are so many of us who have become comfortable in this world. And instead of grappling with the already but the not yet. And instead of praying, come Lord Jesus, we find ourselves in a place where we just say, here and now is good. And this is sufficient. This is heaven enough for me. God, may we not sell ourselves short. We, may we not sell you short. God, allow this to build in us an urgency for the gospel, an urgency for the ministry, knowing that our friends and our family are in these places where they will, at your return, either be glorified and honored and raised up for good and faithful servants, or they will be cast into a place of darkness, separated from you. 
God, build that anticipation in us and build that urgency in us. God, I pray that you would come. I pray that you would come soon and fulfill your promise. God, and for all of the good that you have shown us in this world, that it would be magnified and amplified and our love for you would be unchecked and unhindered. God, I pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. I want to thank you for joining us today. I want to thank you for spending time with us. I want to invite you again to contact me. Uh, my email address is tim at mbc, for Memorial Baptist Church, tim at mbcstratford.ca. Contact me and let me know if you are interested in joining uh, the Bible study, uh, because I will be making that list. Uh, I also want you to contact me if you just want to chat about any of this, if you have questions or if you have concerns, uh, if there's some contact information for a friend or a family member that you want to send my way, I'm happy to be there for you in that way. And may the Lord bless you and keep you and cause His face to shine upon you. May you know that the God who has made promises has been faithful to keep them from the beginning. And his promise to return will be no different. Go in peace and enjoy your week.